Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to Litquake, San Francisco's literary festival and this evening's event, Fantasy and Dystopia, Cory Doctorow with Richard Kadri. This event is being brought to us tonight with support by Craig Newmark Philanthropies. Yes, it seems that the founder of Craigslist is a fan of, of this particular genre and these two authors. I am Jane Ganahl. I'm the co-founder of Litquake. And this 21st year, we have been all virtual, streaming live throughout the Bay Area to points around the world. Our final day is tomorrow, and we have the Lit Crawl to offer you 12 straight hours of Lit Crawling online, including international cities starting at 10.30 tomorrow morning local time. We would like to think that given the crazy, crazy, unbearable stresses of 2020, that Litquake's mission of bringing connection, humanity, and inspiration to our audiences is more important now than ever before. If you're so inclined, we would welcome your donation to our nonprofit festival at Venmo, PayPal, or at litquake.org. We also want to thank everyone in the literary community who helps us put this festival on. This year, as in every other year, this is a, a labor of love by dozens of different groups, and we are grateful for their support. Uh, before I introduce our authors of the evening, a few orders of business. If you can think of a question that you'd like to ask during the event, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to write your question. And then at the end of the hour, I will come on and I will field some of the questions. Um, after the event, you'll be getting an email asking you to fill out a brief survey. Please do that because it helps us find out who our audience is and that helps us raise money, to be completely blunt about it. Do not forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for updates, and you can buy the latest books by our two authors tonight from your book favorite independent bookstore or at the Litquake bookshelf at bookshop.org. Always a tongue twister. And now on with the show. In Cory Doctorow's latest dystopian cyber thriller, Attack Surface, high stakes and real world paranoia keep the pages turning. In her day job as a counterterrorism wizard for a transnational cybersecurity firm, Masha made the hacks that allowed repressive regimes to spy on dissidents and then manipulate their every move. The perks of her job were fantastic and the pay was obscene, but Masha sometimes used her skills to help those same troublemakers evade detection. This was a serious game and a serious rush, but also very self-destructive and unsustainable. The Washington Post just gave the book a major valentine, calling attack surface vigorous, bold, and savvy about the limits of revolution and resistance. That sounds very serious, but it's also a very fun book. In tonight's Litquake event, Dr. O will speak with another New York Times bestseller, best-selling author of fantasy, Richard Cadry, about the enduring appeal of the genre and perhaps touch on why it might be harder than ever to write about dystopian fiction when in fact we seem to be almost living on the verge of dystopia ourselves. Richard Cadry is the New York Times bestselling author of 15 novels, including the Sandman Slim Supernatural Noir series, which is being turned into a movie directed by John Wick director Chad Stahelski. His latest book is Ballistic Kiss. Cory Doctorow was born in Canada and is a science fiction author, journalist, technology activist, and regular contributor to The Guardian, Locus, and many other publications. His award-winning novel, Little Brother, was a New York Times bestseller, as was its sequel, Homeland. His novella, connect, novella collection, Radicalized, was a CBC Best Fiction of 2019 selection. There you have it, all the bona fides. Please welcome Corey and Richard. Richard, you have to uh, uh, turn on your video. Yep. <laughs> Here we go. Turn Here we go. Here we go. Hi. How are you doing? I am very well. It has been a crazy couple of weeks. It turns out that virtual tours are 
in their own way as much work as actual tours, although with less time in fart tubes and I didn't get my daily government genital massage at an airport, so I feel cheated. Well, at the, on the other hand, you get to sit in a nice tiki bar. I do. This is our this is our home bar. This is the plague bar that we built during the plague uh, in order to uh, give us a thing to do. It's the only bar open in Burbank. And it's all yours. And it's all mine. I am the sole customer and the bartender, <laughs> and I give a very generous pour. Oh, uh, there you go. How did you come up with that theme? Uh, the the tiki bar theme? Yeah. Have you always <laughs> wanted a tiki bar? I my grandparents had rec room bars with uh oh. you know glasses with um uh hula girls that uh were thermoreactive and and their bikinis disappeared when when they got when you put cold liquid oh. in them and you know the bar backs were were red velvet with mirror lined with golfing and bowling trophies that my grandparents had won and it was all in the basement and you know they had peeing boy liquor dispensers and my my mother's uh, glitter and pasteboard Sweet Sixteen posters still stuck up on the wall. Amazing. I mean, I, I this this is really like, it's it's my childhood recovered basically. Oh, that's great. So you weren't you weren't you weren't buying old lunch boxes. You're, you're no, no, no. Bars. This is I was I was um, in fact when we uh, finally built the bar and it's literally a shed in our backyard. We. Um, we had things that I had been collecting for as long as 20 years. Like some of these things are, mm -hmm. are, are 20 years old and that I had been saving against the day that I would someday have a tiki bar that I could decorate myself. So this is definitely the uh, apotheosis. Like I can die happy. You don't need to scatter my ashes in the haunted mansion. You can just pour them down the sink here and we'll be fine. With a sh what are we going to pour you down the sink with? What's, what's, what's the last shot you're going to go down with? <laughs> Um, I reckon you couldn't ask for anything more thematically on point than a bottle of then writer's, writer's tears. tears. There you yeah. go. A, a, a whiskey I discovered through um, Spider Robinson, the very, the very good science fiction novelist and whiskey aficionado. I have I, uh, my ritual with writer's tears is I have one shot at, at the end of every book when I finish writing every book. So the bottle lasts a while. I used to buy a pair of shoes at the end of every book, and now I have a lot of yeah. shoes, and I've ceased doing this. <laughs> and so, now I don't know what to do when I finish a book. I finish a book and I start another one. I feel like, um, what's his name? The guy who invented the mailbox, Anthony Trollope. Right. Uh, among other things, invented the mailbox and used to write a thousand words, or 10 pages every day. And he wrote these giant pop boilers that ran to four and 500 pages. And if he finished the, the 500 page book, on page eight of the day, he would set the book aside and start in on page one of the next book. And that's, no. that's more or less what I, I had this, this very anhedonic writing, writing lifestyle because, um, you know, the thing that helped me go was, and, and this is serious, was like 15 years ago, I had this realization that although there were days when the writing felt like it was very good and days when it felt like it was very bad, that in retrospect, I couldn't tell which words I wrote on which day. And although there were passages that were fine and passages that needed work, they weren't correlated. And that the quality of the work, or rather the feeling of the quality of the work was correlated to um, like my blood sugar and anxiety level and the amount of sleep I was getting. And so I should just write, even if I felt like the words were terrible. And that was a very liberating realization for about a decade. And then about a decade in, I went, wait a second the days when I'm very happy with myself because it feels like I'm writing very well, I might be writing utter dross. And then, you know, the whole thing fell apart. And now it's a completely anhedonic experience. Oh, I sit no. down, barf up the words, do the thing, move on to the next task. But I'm, uh, I'm feeling very good about the book that I'm writing now for whatever it's worth. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I wanted to talk to you about pr uh, process because you often post word counts. Like, oh, I did 500 words today. Five days a week. Um, is that because, because 500, I've seen a lot of sort of 500-ish ranges. Is that because you're spacing it between other projects? So you're getting that kind of time? Yeah, I, so I had this dream that someday I would quit my day job and write full time. And, mm -hmm. then, and then I would just be a writer and that would be my gig. And uh, I had been working for the Electronic Frontier Foundation as their European director. And I hit a point 
where I was making enough money from writing and also my time was commanded enough by the writing that I told my boss that I was going to come the new year, resign. And um, I immediately, as a t matter of total coincidence, got offered a Fulbright to come move to LA from London and teach at the University of Southern California. And I conferred with friends and they said, you'd be a fool not to do it. And I never, that launched me on like a 10 year period in which I was not working for EFF, but still doing all kinds of things that weren't writing in order to have stuff to do that I could write about. Mm -hmm. And then after about a decade of that, I got so incensed about the complete devastating failure of technology policy from our governments and the anxiety I felt whenever I contemplated it, that I went back to work for EFF. So I've never not had a day job and I okay. can't imagine not having a day job, like not having, I, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a day job. And, and so I, um, my writing has always been sandwiched in between something else. And uh, the best advice that I didn't take for a long time was to write every day. It, it, mm -hmm. Writing every day, when I first heard it, felt very aspirational, like, like doing an hour of aerobic exercise and getting five helpings of vegetables every day. Like what you would do if you could afford a personal chef and a personal mm -hmm. trainer, not what actual humans were ever going to do. And writing every day was, um, that was enabled by that revelation that, that it didn't matter if the words felt bad, I should write them anyway, because they may be good. And it uh, turned writing into a habit and a habit's a thing that you get for free, you know, having now raised a child to the point where she brushes her teeth without having to be told. I'm here to tell you that there was a time in your life when you did not brush your teeth without someone like standing over you and saying, brush your goddamn teeth, Richard. It's They're true. all going to fall out of your face if you don't. <laughs> now you, I, having, having hung out with you, I can tell you that you brush your teeth every day and that you probably don't remember it. It's probably just a thing that happens automatically on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what I have, I've arrived at is a, a set amount and I set it per book. Uh, the book I'm working on now, I'm writing two pages a day. I plan to be done by Christmas. I'm on track. And uh, every day I sit down and I write my two pages. And some days I feel like I have wasted your time and mine by writing two pages that I'm going to have to go back and rewrite. And some days I feel like I've been kissed by an angel. And there's a part of me that knows that those feelings are unrelated to the quality of the work. And I hit my marks and I like, you know, garbage men don't get garbage men's block. Surgeons don't get surgeons mm -hmm. block. You know, it, when it's your job, it's your job and you do it, even if you feel like, like it's not the day that you would prefer to be doing it. And so that has been both liberating and, uh, and as I say, anhedonic, right? Like it's stolen the joy uh, of, uh, <laughs> of, of feeling like I've been, like I've, like I've found, I've tapped into something amazing and now I can, I can write something that I never, I didn't know was even there. Mm -hmm. You know, now when I'm writing and I feel that way, I'm like, well, maybe I'm just like uh, experiencing a little bit of a dopamine rush that is completely unrelated to the quality of the words and I'll have to go back and rewrite them. But we all get that. All writers get that, that I think. Sure. When you're, I mean, when I get toward the end of a book and I'm on, you know, during those long days, like, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to hit my deadline. So I'm working 10 hours a day and you hit that point where I don't know if I'm writing in English anymore. I'm just <laughs> typing and it's like, this could be Urdu. I have no idea anymore. <laughs> I'm just, there are periods and commas. I know that, that that's happening. And you know, it's, it's funny because I'm such a fan of your work and I've been reading you, as you know, since Metrophage, yeah. uh, which, you know, I, I, I don't know if I've ever admitted this to you. I had a friend who worked in a mall store who stripped copy for me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the thief. When, when I was, when I was, when I was a little skate punk, you know, oh, that's who, great. Who more paperbacks than I could <laughs> afford. Uh, and we used to just and, shoplift. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, you know, it feels like you know I read Butcher Bird and then and then Sandman Slim, and it felt like you tapped into something very deep, like your kind of esoteric love of uh, all of this, like apocrypha and just you know weird demonic stuff had finally found an outlet in the way that I think maybe with Little Brother, you know, mm -hmm. all the all the kind of nerdy. Stuff 
that I've been trying to figure out how to turn into fiction, this kind of deep policy stuff. Bruce Sterling once said, like, I'm having arguments with myself that no one has ever had an argument <laughs> with anyone right. else about, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and I felt like you really hit your mark. And then we're now like 11 books in. And I started to worry about you at a certain point because I felt like you were running out of headroom, right? Because you kept raising the stakes and raising the stakes and raising the stakes. And then we get to Ballistic Kiss and you did a complete reversal. And, you know, for people who haven't read the series, Sandman Slim is this hard-boiled assassin who was sent to hell by the magicians in his LA magic circle, uh, betrayed became a, uh, a gladiator in the pits of hell, escaped from hell, came back, wreaked a terrible vengeance, briefly became Satan, then became God, then became a <laughs> series of other entities, battled, uh, battled uh, uh, you know, all of the forces of earth, then all of the forces of heaven, then all the forces of hell, then all the forces of the universe that exists outside of the forces of heaven and hell. And I was like, <laughs> eventually, Richard, you are gonna run out of stakes to raise here, and yet I feel like you've got stories to tell. And then Ballistic Kiss comes out, and it's an all about addressing anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, you found the stakes that are higher than any external stakes, right? It's your it's your own internal demons, right? Yeah. And um, that uh, struggle to find a way to raise the stakes without making them silly and mm -hmm. finding the thing that is of um, more dramatic urgency than the thing that you have been engaged with till, till now and like really confronting the things that are of the, the highest stakes. It was a thing that I felt like I, I had encountered or, or that, I, that I really got into with the tax surface where you know, you've got a couple of books that are kind of rollicking boys and adventure stuff about you know, fighting the forces of oppression and greed. And then, you know, with the tax service, it's a book about someone having a moral reckoning with their own conscience. And I realized as I was writing it, that that is the highest stakes yeah. fight that you can have. And, you know, it's a novel for adults and people are like, oh, a novel for adults, it must be full of sex. And I'm like, dude, I'm 50 years old. People have a lot more sex when they're teenagers than they do when they're middle-aged. Like adult books are no place for sex. That's, that's teen stuff. Adult <laughs> stuff is looking in the mirror and having a long, hard reckoning with what you've done and who you are, you know? And, and it feels like Ballistic Kiss really got there. Well, that was, yeah, it was my PTSD book. Yeah. Um, very. I mean, I've, I've dealt with PTSD in various ways throughout the series, and I have PTSD, so I've been, I've been dealing with that for years. But yeah, I wanted to, um, the whole series has been about Stark and uh, becoming human, a human being. The first book, Sandman Slim, Stark is very much a monster. He is back, he is vicious, he wants to just, he wants revenge and he wants revenge on the people who sent him to hell. And, but he really wants revenge on the world for letting him down and for God for letting him down. And so over the course of, I now finished the 12th book, which is, which will be out next year. It's about humanizing a complete monster. Like, can you take someone who's 100% broken and slowly kind of rebuild them from the ground up. And yeah, Ballistic Kiss, book 11, was one uh, where I pulled way back and um, really wanted it to be about Stark going inside himself very much. I mean, the whole idea of lowering the stakes in a way started in book seven, Killing Pretty, which is a book I'm fond of because I got to deal with the uh, LA fascism, the whole history of fascism in Los Angeles, which very few people know about, like the Silver Shirts and groups like that. The Silver Shirts were founded the week Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Uh, so I got to deal with a lot of that interesting stuff and bring it back again, sort of down to earth. But um, Ballistic Kiss, yeah, that was a, that's a big one for me. And it leads very directly into the last book, which is both big, but at the same time, it's very small in that it's as much as, as there is a monstrous central character and that Stark has to deal with, but at the same time, yeah, 
it's him trying to walk that line of like, can I, can I be decent? Can I be so, someone um, that another human being would want to be with? So we're now kind of dialing into the notional topic of, of tonight's event, which is dystopia. Yes. And, 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 you know, it's funny you mentioned Los Angeles fascism. I'm, I'm writing a novel now called The Lost Cause, which is an explicit reference to the American neo-fascist movement, the neo-confederate mm. movement. And it's about, uh, it's set here in Burbank, which is a former Sundown town. And it's about truth and reconciliation with white nationalist militias after a successful Green New Deal. And it's an environmental utopian novel that is indistinguishable from an environmental dystopian novel, except in the attitudes that the characters have to the crisis around them. Everything is on fire. There are horrible diseases rampant in the world, mass scale migration and uh, refugee crises triggered by floods, fires and disease uh, and habitat loss and drought. And the difference between a utopia and a dystopia is that they have oriented their society and their economy around the long, difficult project of doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And they call themselves the first generation in a century that doesn't fear the future. That's their, that's their that's like nice. tagline for themselves. And it, it's really got me thinking that the difference between a utopia and a dystopia is not whether everything falls apart, it's whether you get it started up again. Because after all, you know, if you're an engineer who operates on the assumption that everything will be fine, you're not an optimist, you're an asshole, <laughs> right? Like that's the, that's the conclusion that leads you to say, we don't need lifeboats for the Titanic, it's unsinkable, mm -hmm. right? And, and that, what, what, amounts to, what, what amounts to a kind of informed optimism is the belief that the second law of thermodynamics can't be repealed, that, that things do break down, but that also we're not like the rump of a fallen civilization that is uh, incapable of rebuilding the structures that we built in years gone by when they fall apart. That, you know, that the, the roads, the hospitals, the, the systems of aid that we rely on every day can't be rebooted when things go wrong, which they will because nothing is eternal. And, you know, I, I think that we mistake dystopian furniture for the dystopian hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's great to have a Morton Joe and, and Furiosa chasing each other in giant trucks. Uh, but the, the difference between utopia and dystopia is not whether you have the trucks, it's what happens at the end of the movie. It's whether or not people can be redeemed. And, you know, as we like live through these plague months and as we approach a moment that might devolve into civil war in a couple of weeks, you know, that that question is so much on my mind. My, uh, my great fear of dystopia is related to your novel. Like it, when everything falls apart and we have to rebuild that somehow I will be assigned to the farm because there is nothing I hate more than gardening and farming. And I, I, my ah. mother's family were farmers. I was forced to garden as a child. I would rather do any, I'll clean out the sewers if I don't have to plant anything. You could be one of the horseback librarians. You can, I, I, you can, I'd happily be a horseback librarian. You can go and deliver, and, and, and let me plug here one of the great dystopian novels of the last year, Sarah Gailey's um, Upright Women Wanted, which is uh, a kind of Mad Max meets the Civilian Conservation Corps librarian division. Oh, brilliant. Who were actual like, lady librarians who filled their panniers with, with books and rode horses up and down the narrow mountain passes of Appalachia circulating literature to to the people in their most remote places in america during the depression it, it's a it's a superb book about about hope right about which is not optimism you know it's the it's, right. hope is the idea that not that things will be fine no matter what we do but rather that if we take a step to materially improve our conditions that we we're might we're losing your audio we're losing oh, your, I beg audio. your pardon is that better yeah Oh, great. Sorry, I got away from the mic there. Uh, that, that if we materially improve our conditions, then we might ascend to a level from which we 
can ascertain new paths that we can take that you know that that seeing a path from from here to perfection is a thing that is a convenience of the novel not right. a thing that we live through as humans in the world and that when the you know that that the best we can hope for as people living in the world is not to know the terrain but rather to have a heuristic a rule of thumb that lets us like ascend the gradient towards a better place i was this reminds me um one of the things i i found interesting about some of the characters in attack surface was um you refer to them as the character that fascinates me to this day is you call them robert oppenheimers yeah and that really struck me very hard i mean I, you want to say who oppenheimer is for people who might not sure know? yeah oppenheimer was this brilliant physicist and there were a lot of brilliant nuclear physicists in the in during the war but he was also a brilliant manager and so he had this incredible double skill set that was uh possibly unreplicable at the time there weren't other people who could have done what he did and so he was tapped to run the manhattan project and he was both good enough at his discipline and good enough at organizing people that he was able to marshal the nuclear bomb and famously when the first bomb went off he started quoting the bhagavad gita i am become death of the destroyer of worlds and embarked on a lifelong career of self-flagellation for mm -hmm. having given birth to the nuclear bomb. He was, he was called into the president's office to congratulate him for having built the nuke. And he said, Mr. President, I have blood on my hands. And the president <laughs> kicked him out of his office and told his aides, don't let that son of a bitch back in the Oval Office again. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he became a kind of fixture in the anti-nuclear proliferation movement, which is a movement that I was very involved in, speaking of dystopia, that I was very involved in as a kid uh, and an adolescent, um, you know, arrested with my father at, at uh, arms, you know, at nuclear uh, uh, refineries, arrested on my own at nuclear uh, arms bazaars, um, you know, a fixture in the protest movement and so on. And it strikes me that although Oppenheimer's story is a powerful story about confronting the moral valence of your work, that it's also a story about the dangers of waiting to confront right. the moral valence of your work, right? That like, what we need are some premature fucking Oppenheimers. Like, mm -hmm. wouldn't it have been great if Oppenheimer had looked in the mirror <laughs> one morning in Los Alamos and said, you know what? If I actually build this goddamn bomb, I'm never gonna get a good night's sleep again. And you know, we talk about the ecological crisis and the pandemic cr crisis and the crisis of rising authoritarianism as though the threat of nuclear Armageddon is behind us. You know, one of, the, one of the most salient issues about a contested election in the month to come is that there may be two or more people who have a claim to the codes to initiate world annihilating nuclear Armageddon. <laughs> and one of them is a senile hair sniffer and the other one is a sociopath. And the fact that, that we are at this juncture and that we just pretend that it's not a problem is itself quite remarkable. And will not end. This is not the last time we're gonna be here, I think. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very buoyed up, speaking of utopia and dystopia, I'm very buoyed up mm -hmm. by the tech won't build it movement. Because the thing about Oppenheimer is that if he'd said no, they might not have been able to find another Oppenheimer. And the thing about, oh, you know- Edward, Michelle, Teller, Edward Teller would have rushed in there to, 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 to try <laughs> and do right. it. You're right. But you know, the thing about like machine learning and AI and, and, and all of this like advanced surveillance stuff that we're building now is those workers are in incredibly high demand because there's just not many people who have the praxis to do it. And you know, eventually there will be, you know, all skills eventually become commodified. But you know, right the reason that like Google and Facebook are offering them giant stock options and kombucha on tap and free massages on Wednesdays is not because they're like good hearted slobs, right? It's because they're terrified that they'll walk off the goddamn job. Yeah. And 20,000 Googlers walked off the job in 2018, mm -hmm. right? Over, over 
sexual harassment in the workplace, over complicity with drone strikes, over um, the uh, uh, um, the the uh, Chinese censor censored search tool that Google was building, yeah. and you know, Google finds it hard to build technology without capital, but it will also find it hard to build technology without engineers. Well, and has, has anything happened? I'm sorry to interrupt. Has anything yeah. happened since it came came to light that they were selling keyword searches to cops? No, but the thing that I think might trigger it is is this week's revelation that they are um, they've joined with Palmer Lucky, you know the the the, the way faced neo fascist founder of Oculus, yeah. to build border control technologies. Oh, um, good. That was revealed by Jack Polson, who is one of the Googlers who quit his job over the Chinese censorship tool. Um, Jack's a Torontonian like me. And he's an AI researcher, not like me. And uh, when he discovered the, the Chinese uh, search tool that they were building that, that both censored search results and also gave the names of people who were searching for forbidden topics to the Politburo so they could figure out who to arrest and murder and harvest the organs of, uh, you know, he quit his job. And now he's got a nonprofit that's just foying government contracts to find out what Google's up to. Yeah, and and I think that might trigger something. I mean, even in these very dire times when everyone is very worried, people who have that narrow skill set are still in demand in a way that allows them to decide what they're going to do. Yeah, and you saw this at Amazon this year, where you had a number of of Amazon senior technologists who declared solidarity with their warehouse workers up to and including Tim Bray, you know, the guy who created XML, who actually quit Amazon over the way it, the way it was treating its, its warehouse workers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, like, I think people are waking up and realizing that the dream that they once had of a kind of unfettered technology landscape in which they could do what they would and eventually grow to be kind of the next Steve Jobs has been replaced by a web where five giant websites are filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And the best they can hope for is to be like a cherished court sorcerer mm -hmm. to some, you know, massive firm, but never to challenge it. And if, and if you don't see a path to yourself becoming the a temporarily embarrassed billionaire, why support the policies that support billionaires? And, and, you know, in some ways, Attack Surface is about that moral reckoning. You know, the first two books, they, they inspired a say, lot of technology. Say the names for people who haven't read them. Uh, I beg your pardon, Little Brother and Homeland. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> uh, they inspired a lot of technologists and human rights workers and cyber lawyers who approached me after they came out to say, look, I read these books and they set me on a path to wanting to build technology as a force for human liberation and wanting to oppose technology as a force for human oppression. And I, uh, and, and that's how I got to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And the new book is about the people who didn't heed the warning, the people who have found themselves now working to take away the freedoms that technology gave them, the, the, that heady rush of being able to write code that performs your will perfectly and infinitely of being able to join a network and find people who know the names for the things that you felt all your life, but have never been able to express, mm -hmm. you know, that's, um, that's the, the, the thing that um, I, I hope we can f exploit as a fracture line that all of these tools of technological oppression are built by people who are attracted to technology by technological liberation. And if we can speak to the contradiction there, maybe we can bring them into uh, a place where they realize that their interests are not aligned with taking away other people's self-determination, but rather uh, helping the people who are struggling to make the world safe for human habitation mm -hmm. uh, resist the powers of oligarchy and oppression. Do you think, I, I go back and forth on this one, that people are able to, individuals have a chance to protect themselves. And I'm thinking about real simple tools. V, does, you, does using VPN and Signal mean anything anymore? 
yeah, it does. Like I'm not a privacy nihilist, right? Like doing stuff matters. Installing an ad blocker, installing a tracker blocker, using an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger, especially if you've got nothing to hide because, you know, the only people who, who use encrypted messengers are people who have something to hide. Then we can just round up all the people who use encrypted messengers. We don't have to even know what's in the encrypted messaging tools. We just go like, look, you've got something to hide. Off you go to the to the you know, the cages that we've stuck the children of, of migrants who are separated from their families at the borders into. Uh, and, and, and all of that stuff matters. But ultimately, I think the vision of the cypherpunks, which was that we could build a kind of demimonde that existed alongside of and within oppressive states where cryptography protected us from the power of those states, that that vision is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. That, you know, in the face of rubber hose cryptanalysis, which is when someone breaks your key, not by subjecting it to mathematical analysis, but rather than by, by tying you to a chair and hitting you with a rubber hose until you tell them what the passphrase is, <laughs> that, that our only defense against that is legitimate, proportionate, responsive governance, right? Governments that, that are answered to the people whom they govern. And so the role of cryptographic tools, the role of privacy tools, is to create the space that is temporarily secured from oppression mm -hmm. in which we can organize movements to force states to be accountable to the people they govern. And that there is no substitute for that, that technology yeah. cannot and will not ever substitute for good democratic governance. And that ultimately the way that we are governed is by the forces of code, the things that are technologically possible, law, the things that are lawful to do, norms, the things that are socially acceptable, and markets, the things that are profitable. And that when you run out of headroom in one of those, like when you are like trying to build code that will make people free and your code isn't working anymore, that lever has been pulled as far as it'll go. And you need to find another lever to pull on, right? You need mm -hmm. to change the regulatory environment or you need to change the normative environment. You know, like that's, that's one of the places where I think uh, privacy tools have an enormous power is in establishing the norm that we should by default be private, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that you know, if, if your little league team or book club requires people to join Facebook in order to participate in it, it's not so different from saying that in order to like play in this little, little league team, all of the parents have to get into this closet in which I chain smoke, right? <laughs> that, that it is a, a socially unacceptable thing to do to force other people to expose themselves to, to Zuckerbergianism in order to participate in daily lives. Mm -hmm. And if we promulgate that norm, then the law, technology, and markets will follow because lawmakers do things that accord with the norms of the people who elect them, and markets follow the, the uh, preferences of people. And, uh, and, and um, technologists put their uh, intellect to work in building the tools that reflect the norms that are alive in our world today. Well, this reminded me, um, speaking of privacy and uh, markets and all that, you have, besides um, a tax service, you have something else out now called mm -hmm. How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, which is a pretty important uh, topic and work in itself. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. Yeah, that came out in August. As I mentioned, I had four books out in 2020. It's been a busy and weird year. Uh, and How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism is something of a, a gloss or rebuttal to Shoshana Zuboff's book about surveillance capitalism and her scholarly work on it. And I think that Zuboff's category error is that she assumes that technologists are evil geniuses and that the claims that they make about how well their tools work at manipulating us should be taken at face value. And I think that technologists are secretly quite glad of this critique. I think that if you're going to be uh, an evil genius, at least you're a genius. And, and you know, there's some comfort in, in being a genius. But I think the story that goes that like Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin built a mind control ray to sell your kids fidget spinners 
and then Robert Mercer and Cambridge Analytica stole it to make your uncle a racist, <laughs> gives an enormous amount of credit to what amounts to kind of marketing puffery, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of the evidence we have for how well Google works at changing our views or Facebook works at changing our views comes from Facebook's own sales force. We're trying to sell ads to people, right? And, and this is not a reliable source of information. And there is a far more parsimonious and simple explanation for what it is Facebook and Google are doing, which is that they're just establishing banal monopolies, right? Like if Facebook influences what you believe, it's because they've hijacked all of your social relations and taken everyone that you like hostage. And they only show you parts of what your friends are saying and parts of what the people you like are saying and your family members are saying. And so you end up with a stilted view of the world. That is not mind control. That's just dominance. And we have some pretty straightforward remedies for dominance. We have the entire apparatus of trust busting that we used to destroy the absolutely ordinary, mediocre sociopaths of Standard Oil and AT&T and all the other monopolists that came uh, before the Reagan era, when we just decided not to enforce antitrust law anymore. And the problem with, with Zuboff's uh, diagnosis is that she is basically saying that big tech is like a comet headed towards the earth. And if we were to like blow that comet up by breaking it up and turning these giant monopolies into smaller companies, they just become a meteor shower that would absolutely like blanket the earth with thousands of, you know, ultrasonic <laughs> nuclear grade impacts, right? That, that would wipe out uh, all of us and that we could never, we couldn't even keep track of them. And that what we need to do is keep the meteor intact, keep the comet intact, but just steer it, right? Like just mm -hmm. enlist Google to be an arm of the state, enlist Facebook to be an arm of the state, regulate them and tame them. I don't think we can tame monopolies, right? The, the, the absolute uh, spectacular revenues that monopolies are able to extract from the market combined with the easy solutions that they find to the um, collective action problem, right? When there's only five companies, you can figure out a common position that you want from your regulators, mm -hmm. that that amounts to a, a, a problem that we cannot address simply by asking them to do better. That, that what we must do is destroy their power and their power comes from monopoly. And so we need to lean on anti-monopoly remedies. And so that's what that book is, the, the How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism book. I mean, it's really, it's a pamphlet. It's a long pamphlet, 30, 40,000 words. It started as a review of Zuboff's book and it just metastasized. Mm. And, and so, you know, very grateful to Medium for publishing it in that weird and awkward format. Well, I, I know we're going we're gonna to take some questions later, but I want to talk about one of your other books this year. Sure. And that is, I know you have it because I saw it on, on your tabletop yep. right there. Posey the Monster Slayer. Let's yeah. hear about that. Who is so this, Posey, first off? Well, Posey is my daughter, Posey Taylor Doctorow. Posey Emmeline Fibonacci Nautilus Taylor Doctorow, <laughs> my daughter, whose name was chosen for many reasons, but among them, breaking databases. And, uh, and, and Posey the Monster Slayer is uh, it's a bedtime story. It's a picture book for sort of, you know, four to six-year-olds about uh, a little girl who is obsessed with monsters and who, after her parents tuck her in uh, to bed, she... Um, repurposes her toys in her bedroom as field expedient monster slaying weapons and hunts the monsters who come into her room and wakes up her parents. And at every juncture, her parents come into her room and insist that she go back to bed. Uh, you know, there, there, there's her mom telling her to go back to bed. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me get that framed up in the frame. And, and gradually, her parents are, are turning into zombies themselves because if, as every parent knows, uh, when, you're, when your kid is running around at night haunting vampires, you are gradually turning into a sleep-deprived zombie, and the moment arrives where they go full zom, <laughs> and, and zombies turned out to be the only thing that, that Posey the Monster Slayer can't defeat, but all they want to do is tuck her into bed. And so it's uh. meant to be a, a, a fun kind of uh, bedtime read, but also a story about being a maker and a story about confronting your fears. Mac Rockefeller, who did the art, um, I, I told him I wanted to really lean on those universal monsters 
uh, the, the classic monsters that I, as a monster kid who was 150% obsessed with monster movies, the haunted mm-hmm. mansion, spook houses, that, that we could see that reflected in this book. And it is really, in addition to being a bedtime story, it is a primer and training manual for monster kids to grow up to be monster grownups. And I know that uh, you are also a monster grownup. And so I expect that you, uh, you appreciate this. I, I, I'm, I have a copy on order, in fact. I am delighted to hear that. Thank you. Yes. I, I love the art and I love the, uh, the whole idea of it. I love it, Matt, I love it being your kid. Yes. Matt's such a good artist. And I see Jane is back with us. Yes, Hi, Jane. I, I am because I wanted to moderate a few questions from the audience for the last 15 or so minutes of this conversation, right. which is so wonderful. I hate to interrupt, but there's some good stuff here. Um, Let's see, to Corey, how does attack surface fit with your books, um, Makers and Walk Away? So I think it's a lot closer to Walk Away than Makers. Um, You know, Walk Away is a novel about uh, this idea that people are foundationally good, but that social circumstances can cause us to upregulate or downregulate our best impulses. And you know, Walk Away is a novel about a young woman confronting a lifetime of rationalization that allowed her to give in to her worst impulses, coming to grips with that and and making her peace with it and finding out who she's going to be once she makes that confrontation. And, you know, Walk Away was written kind of at the early days of the Me Too movement and Attack Surface is, is you know, clearly embedded in the midst of it. And as we as we move beyond the very childish and embarrassing regime of just assuming that if we'd like something that someone did that their sins can be erased and instead confronting and reckoning with the the bad things that the people we love and the people who made things that we love did it's it's a book about what redemption looks like and and how redemption is not erasure how n- the the idea that your moral history is a kind of ledger and on one side are all the good things you did for other people. And on the other side are all the terrible things you did to other people. And provided that you're in credit, you can be reckoned as a good person. And if you're in, in debit, then you're a bad person. And instead it, it demands that we think of ourselves as people whose bad deeds can never be erased, but whose good deeds can also never be erased. And that as we, as once we, reckon with the bad things we've done and confront them and make amends for them that they still remain part of who we are and and can never be taken away and that we just have to live with that we have to make that part of the rest of our lives after we confront it and there are people who will never forgive us and there are people who will attempt to erase it and that we need to navigate those two extremes. Um, and Walk Away is very much a book about that and Attack Surface even more so. And, you know, the next book, The Lost Cause, more, more than anything. And I am, um, it's a subject I'm obsessed with. I mean, w- w- as a science fiction writer, you know, I'm uh, I'm a relatively young science fiction writer at 50. The the kind of golden age of science fiction is at this point about 85, mm-hmm. and they're dropping dead like crazy. And there are a lot of obits, and the obits uh, spark a lot of controversy because people are trying to understand what the legacy is of someone who was absolutely horrible to someone that they care about, but incredibly wonderful to someone that they love Mm -hmm. and you know watching that discourse within science fiction has been um instructive and sometimes demoralizing uh and and i've come to the conclusion having having been through it that um the best we can hope for is to acknowledge the good and the bad and not try to decide whether they balance, but rather to say that they both exist no matter what. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, Here's a question for both of you. Um, 
you both uh, sort of straddle fiction and nonfiction and are very much up on the latest tech and privacy issues. Um, so how hard is it to fictionalize and what is the desire to fictionalize when real life already feels so kind of crazy and like you can't make this shit up kind of crazy? <laughs> Richard, do you want to take first crack at that? I want to hear what you have to say. Because oh, okay. I'm really curious. No, because I'm really curious because of the nature of this new book, which sure. is which is again coming at the science fictional aspect of things, but coming posing big moral questions. Yeah. At the same time. It reminded me of your. Some of it reminded me of your story, Radicalized. Uh huh. I, I thought of that a lot. Uh, for people who haven't read it, it's about a nice, ordinary, regular guy who gets screwed by an insurance company ends up on some online forums and finds himself sucked into a very bad, dangerous world that ends up ruining his life and other people's lives too. Suicide bombers killing healthcare executives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To be, to uh, be specific. <laughs> to be specific. Um, um, so little brother was a bet and it was a bet on, on that three things would remain true over the long term. The first was that, computer science would remain relatively static, right? That we wouldn't be able to develop impossible computers that did things that no computer scientist knew how to do, like maybe a computer that could encrypt data really well if you had good intentions, but whose encryption would fail completely if you were doing something illegal. Um, and, and second, that computers would continue to be more salient, that they would expand so that the policy we had around computers would become more important to uh, the way that we lived our lives day to day. And, and finally, that lawmakers and companies and really the public consensus would fail to come to grips with the first two facts. Mm -hmm. and, and so here we are 14 years after I wrote the first Little Brother book, 12 years after it was published. And people read it as a very contemporary story. You know, it, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, apart from the lack of social media in that book, which really, like, I could have put in there, except I was still hoping that Facebook would turn out to go the way of MySpace and Friendster and <laughs> disappear rather than try to swallow the entire internet. Um, you know, that, 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 that those three bets paid off. Mm -hmm. And Attack Surface continues to, to, to dig into those three fundamentals and, and really says that, you know, although there is a long tradition in techno thrillers of treating computers as metaphors rather than dealing with them as they are, that there is so much story potential in the, in the real world potential and, and constraint of what computers can and can't do that you can build stories around that you would be a fool to, to conceive of an imaginary computer Mm -hmm. as a way of, of finding drama for your story when there's so much drama to be found in what computers can and can't do today in the real world. And so, you know, Attack Surface, like the first two Little Brother books, is partly about finding those dramatic beats that are latent in computer science and partly about being news that you can use, right? Partly about being a, a means of dramatizing the somewhat abstruse and often dry technical realities of computers that have become so salient to our daily lives. I mean, even before the pandemic, but now, you know, we've, we've moved from a moment where computers were involved in everything we did to a movement where computers are required for everything we do. And so my, my, my bet here is that people will find expository sections that delve into the minutiae and the technical reality of computers, exciting and enticing rather than off-putting because they recognize in them the material that relates to their daily lived experience. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you mentioned the three books. I had this I don't know if it's a theory or just an observation or a crank or, or, or a crank theory in both. The th if you look at Little Brother, Homeland, and Attack Surface, you almost have the sort of classic three stages of life. 
you wow. have the child, you have the adolescent, and then you have the adult in that gray area of life with all that moral ambiguity that we live with every day. And um, yeah, I, it's, I, it's a not fair intentional, point. I'm sure. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. You know, like, so I can, I can tell you the moment at which I decided that I would try young adult fiction. Um, mm -hmm. I was teaching the Clarion Science Fiction Writing Workshop in 2005 and, uh, or no, it was 2007, I beg your pardon. Uh, and, uh, and, and Kathy Koja, the horror writer who then became a young adult writer, who then became, I don't even know how you characterize her anymore. She's a- Just, just great, writer. just kind of yeah, brilliant. Yeah, great alternate history, marionette erotica diesel punk writer. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 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 Kathy uh, came to, to speak at my class and she talked about writing young adult fiction and she said that writing young adult fiction was particularly uh, satisfying because when she did school visits, kids would come up and argue with her about her books. Mm. And until then, I'd subscribe to Stephen Bruce's theory about people arguing with you about your books. Steve Bruce, who's a great fantasy writer, he says that... Um, telling someone they wrote a bad book is like telling them got, they've got an ugly kid. Even <laughs> if it's true, it doesn't matter because clearly they did everything they could to prevent it and now it's too late for them to do anything about it. <laughs> but she said, you know, kids argue with you about your books because they take them seriously. They're trying to figure out how to navigate the world. Right. And, and so at that moment, I started thinking about writing fiction for kids. And I went to Australia for a science fiction convention and I met someone who for many years I thought was Garth Nix. And I told this story and I said, Garth Nix told me this thing. And then I ran into Garth and he was like, I never told you that. It sounds very smart, but it wasn't me. Um, and, and this person who was not Garth Nix said that writing about adolescence, you get a, you get a kind of freebie because if you're an adolescent, you're doing things for the first time and doing things for the first time has its own intrinsic dramatic uh, moment. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're telling a life of consequence for the first time or, or engage in an act of self-sacrifice for the first time, you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so there's this intrinsic drama that the 50th time you do it is not there. Mm -hmm. And 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 that makes the job of a YA writer a lot simpler. And when I wrote Little Brother, I really, really leaned into those two observations and by the time I got to attack surface, you know, I'm a dad and a husband and living in the apocalypse and 20 years into my career as a civil rights worker and as a blogger. And I'm more thinking about the mistakes that I made and the mistakes I averted, the things that are on one side of my ledger and the things that are on the other side of my ledger than I was when I wrote Little Brother 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a good question that may, in fact, close out the conversation, but uh, Danielle says, Corey, I once heard you say that a good spec fic author can look at a new technology and extrapolate out to unexpected consequences in the future, like looking at the rise of automobiles and deducing teenage makeout culture of the 50s. So for both of you, what are some unexpected surprising consequences that you think might happen in the future based on our current technology? I've got one that just amused the hell out of me. And you can tell cyberpunk authors from other people. The moment people start talking about self-driving cars, every science fiction writer and, and certainly every cyberpunk I knew first said, bombs, <laughs> bomb delivery <laughs> systems, every single one. <laughs> huh, that's very good. You know, I want to say that TikTok is the great surprise of 2020. It's, it is the most cyberpunk of all. I just came off of a, an eight session T a virtual tour for for attack surface and one of the guests on it was was bruce sterling who dialed in from ibiza at two in the morning wearing a beret and a hoop earring as you do <laughs> when you're bruce sterling and and he made the point that here we have this like piece of chinese military surveillance contract uh, uh, uh technology grounded in remix culture appealing to gen z that relies on 
the um, you know indifference to surveillance intrinsic in big tech's own ecosystems. You know that that like if Google and and Apple had set out from the start to build devices whose apps couldn't spy on you, there wouldn't be a TikTok, right? There'd be no space mm -hmm. for it, right? The fact that they permitted spying so that you know Hewlett Packard and and uh, you know um, Unilever could could figure out what you were looking at uh, opened up this space in which teen folk culture related to Katy Perry and, uh, um, you know, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm blanking on her name, Billie Eilish, mm. uh, could then, uh, you know, create a, a, an attack surface within the local area networks of households around the world. It is a, you know, you couldn't write that shit. Like, it is just too weird and Baroque. And then the fact that like Trump decided to hand the company over to a major donor, Larry Ellison, who's one of technology's yeah. great creeps. Like what, what a, a, what a, what a coincidence. Turn. What a coincidence yeah. that one well, of his also, friends. Yeah, what a heel turn, right? Like the idea that, that a company whose major product is lawsuits would, would inherit like teen culture. It's like, the monkeys being taken over by Lockheed Martin or something like it's a, <laughs> it's a very weird turn indeed. You know, I, I, I look forward to the next, uh, um, the next stage in the saga, particularly as the father of a 12 year old in Southern California who spends every hour that God sends on TikTok. I mean, you know, the, it, it is, these are, these are live issues for, for us and our family and our local area network. Mm -hmm. I have one more quick question and just that was, what was the name of the book that Corey mentioned about women who took books on horseback to people upright, in population? Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey from Tor.com. Uh, cool. Absolutely superb book. I think uh, that was one of the reviews that the LA Times ran that I wrote. If not, I, I put it on pluralistic.net. Okay. Um, and then there was one that just says Kathy question mark last name question mark Koja K A T H E K O J A. Everyone should go read Kathy Koja. She is the best kept secret of science fiction, fantasy, horror, young adult fiction, and puppet erotica. And her book, The Cipher, just has a new edition out. So yeah, it's that's perfect, right. Perfect timing. Yeah, her debut novel, which launched uh, Dell's Splatterpunk uh, imprint. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was a bookseller then. They had the very best giveaway uh, yeah. for, for, um, that, uh, for that new imprint. They gave us box cutters, which were basically razors. Uh, uh, and they said, uh, uh, Dell Horror, The Cutting Edge. Brilliant. I still have mine somewhere. Good. Well, I want to thank uh, both of you, Richard and Corey, for an incredibly engaging and you know, enlightening conversation tonight. Um, I'm so glad that Richard managed to pull himself out of the sick bed to <laughs> join us. And I hope you get your voice back when this is all over. And Thank you. Corey, you know, God, I was, wish I was with you in your bar. That just looks so oh. incredible. That's sort Anytime of- Anytime you're in Southern California, there. come by for a drink. You are more than welcome. Well, please, please buy these gentlemen's book. And we have one more day of Litquake. Uh, the Lit Crawl is tomorrow. Please check our website for the extravaganza that will go on for 12 hours tomorrow and have probably <laughs> 12 times four is almost 50 authors tomorrow. Tomorrow right. alone. So and, thanks, and guys. Wear thanks. a mask. Register wear to vote. Mask. Vote, vote. Mask. And have Independent bookstores. Resist exactly. fascism, independent bookstores, <laughs> get five helpings of vegetables, That's do right. an hour of aerobic exercise every day. All those and writer's tears. Exactly. All right, guys. All right. Thanks for joining. Take care. Right. Thanks, you. Thank Thanks, you. Richard. Good night. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Corey. This is great.